Hi guys, welcome back to Fertility Friday q and I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford and I'm answering your fertility questions. Hi there friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. Welcome back to Fertility Friday Q&A where I answer all of your fertility questions. Just for reference, you can go to the community tab where there's a Q&A section and you can ask your questions there. You can also ask them in the comments of this video and we will sort through some of your questions and answer them each week on Friday. So feel free to ask away and then subscribe and follow along to this channel. I'm a board certified OBGYN and fertility doctor and this channel has also spread knowledge to you. Also, if you're interested in learning more about your natural fertility, I have a 10 week program that's gonna teach you everything you need to know called Enhance Your Natural Fertility. You can find out more on my website, Natalie Crawford MD. Let's dive in. All right, question one. Hi, Natalie. Can I start taking prenatal vitamins and doing other things to prepare my body for a healthy pregnancy while still taking birth control until I'm ready? If so, how long would you recommend preparing my body before coming off the pill and trying to conceive? Thanks so much. Love this series. Hey, love you too. Okay, yes, you can absolutely start taking prenatal vitamins and actually start preparing your body for pregnancy even while you're on the pill. When it comes to the birth control pill, the birth control pill is a combination of estrogen and progesterone that works by telling the brain to stop sending out any FSH. And when you don't send out FSH, you don't ovulate. That's good because you don't want to be pregnant if you're taking the pill. However, it doesn't change the natural rate of losing eggs. That is a constant. But when you've been on the pill for a long time, it might take the brain a moment or two to wake back up and remember how to ovulate. So I always recommend that you stop the pill about three to six months before you want to get pregnant. That way it gives the brain time to wake up and you can see how your natural cycle pattern is. You will want to prevent pregnancy in another way with condoms or avoiding because if you don't want to be pregnant, you don't want to be pregnant, but that's a good time to be getting your body ready as well. So I recommend a prenatal vitamin every day with at least 400 micrograms of folic acid. I recommend having some vitamin D, making sure that you get that. That's often in prenatal vitamins and then omega-3 fatty acids or your fish oil like DHA and EPA also often in a prenatal, but if it's not, you'll want to take a separate pill. I also want you to start being prepared to tackle your fertility or to have your fertility journey. And so what this means for us is that you want to start eating healthy foods. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains, you want to be exercising and getting your body strong for pregnancy and prioritizing your own mental and spiritual health. So getting sleep, journaling, meditating, trying to drop your stress down because trying to get pregnant can be stressful. I also recommend when you come off the pill, starting to watch and track your cycles because if they are irregular, so after three months of being off the pill, if your pattern has not come back or it's very irregular, you want to see your OBGYN to try to figure out why. All right. Can you do IUI if your partner has to do a sperm aspiration in relation to a failed vasectomy reversal or is IVF the only option? This is a really good question. So when you do a vasectomy, you are cutting the vas deferens. This is the connecting tube in male anatomy from making sperm, which made in the testes, into getting into the ejaculated sample. When you go try to do a reversal of that vasectomy, it's not always successful, and sometimes because of scar tissue, there can be blockage. When you go and aspirate the sperm, you're going above the level of where it was cut, so usually into the epididymis, and taking a sperm sample out. It is typically not enough for an IUI. So typically that sample is smaller and you have to use it for IVF. So this is one of the downsides to a vasectomy that people don't talk about is that they're not always reversible. And if you wanna get pregnant after one, you might have to combine an aspiration of your sperm, so needle into epididymis or testes, in addition to IVF or in vitro fertilization where we take the eggs out of the body. And that's because I only need one sperm per every egg for IVF. For IUI, I need to have at least 20 million moving sperm, and that's often not enough from what we can get from that aspirated sample. All right, trying to conceive and using OPK. I never get a full peak surge. The line will get darker, but never as dark as the control line. Did I miss it or is something wrong? Well, first I'd wanna ask how you did the test because what I find is sometimes the instructions in the box are not the best. The box instructions often tell you to test first thing in the morning because they want a concentrated sample of urine. However, physiologically, this just doesn't make sense. Your brain releases LH in the early morning hours. LH is the hormone that they're trying to detect for the surge. The LH surge only lasts about 12 to 24 hours. 
and its excretion in your urine is going to be different based on how fast or slow your metabolism is. However, there's a chance that if your LH surge is short living, then it releases from your brain in the early morning and it's not fully in your urine by the time you take the test at six or seven in the morning. And then by the time you take it the next morning, it's already starting to leave your system. So because of this, I recommend that you take one OPK a day in the midday range for between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So take one OPK in that time frame and then that's going to give you a more accurate representation. Similarly, we do want to make sure even though water is great for our body, if it is too dilute of a sample, it will throw off the results a little bit. So that's one of the negative things is that I usually recommend, you know, making sure that you're not just pounding water in the morning before you take it so that you can still get a nice concentrated sample to give you an accurate result. Remember that the LH surge is not the day of ovulation, it's the day before ovulation. LH surge initiates ovulation. So if you're trying to time cycles with an OPK, you wanna target intercourse on the day of the positive surge, the day before you ovulate, and the day after, which is going to be the actual day that you do ovulate. All right, how can I best advocate for myself in this situation? My OBGYN said no need to test if I don't want fertility treatment. I can't afford IVF, but I'm open to taking meds and IUI. I thought it would be common practice to do hormonal blood work and check ovarian reserve and HSG tests at this point. I'm trying to conceive naturally for the first time at 42. Over four months of timed intercourse using OPKs and BBTs, and I've watched so many of your videos and learned so much, yet still feel lost. I recommend if you're 40 and over, you get fertility testing right away. So what you're asking for is what I recommend. HSG, semen analysis, and hormone testing. If you have an OBGYN who says not, then, then go find another one or just call a fertility clinic because to be honest, you have limited time and we want to help you the best. Even though natural conception is so possible, if your sperm counts really low or your tubes are blocked, you need the opportunity to intervene. Sometimes saying things like, I'm not going to do fertility treatments just feels like a big red flag and somebody doesn't want to evaluate you further. I don't think that should be the case, but I think forget that. Just say, I want my fertility tested. I know I'm 42. Can you refer me to the doctor? Can you do the testing? Do you recommend a fertility doctor I should see? And if your OB is not helping you, either find another one or go see REI right away because we are not gonna hesitate to test you at age 42. All right, similar. How do you talk to your OB about a fertility test like an HSG? And then can you talk about progesterone? Which is a really broad question. So can you talk about progesterone? Yes, whole video on it. So maybe watch that one to learn more. Um, how to talk to your OB about a fertility test. I find so many people are getting barriers built up from their OBs, and I think the best way to approach it is just an honest discussion. Hey, I know I haven't been trying to conceive or I haven't started yet, but I had chlamydia in the past and I know that can damage my fallopian tubes. Do you think we can order an HSG to check so I can find out if they're open? Same thing, like, hey, I'm really worried because of this pelvic pain that I have endometriosis like my sister does. Do you think we could check an HSG so that I can feel more comfortable as we start trying to get pregnant? And if something's off, I could go see the fertility doctor sooner. I find that when you approach things with a realistic view, not just demanding things, but you just clearly state what you want and why you want it, it's really hard for somebody to say no to you. Like that's a very reasonable request. Hey, I know it's not standard to check my eggs, but I'm considering freezing them. Could you maybe draw an AMH test so that I could go get an appointment sooner if I need to? Or just let them know you do something different. I hope the tide is turning here and I find so many OBs in my town are really willing and want to do more testing earlier because they want to help you. Your goals are their goals. But there are some others who are trained in an era of, nope, we don't do that until you've been trying for a year. And if that's the hesitation you're getting, then maybe that's not the best provider for you and you need a different doctor. All right, can Clomid work for endometriosis? Are there any risks with trying Clomid before jumping to IVF? Also, I just wanna say thanks so much for sharing such informative content with us, thank you. Okay, Clomid maybe can work for endometriosis. So Clomid helps by telling the brain to send out a stronger signal of FSH, therefore it helps you ovulate. Clomid is best if you do not ovulate, number one. So if you have irregular periods and you do not reliably ovulate, Clomid's a good option. Clomid is secondarily okay for unexplained infertility. When you don't know what's going on, it is an okay option if you're just trying to improve the odds. Make somebody ovulate more than one egg if they're already ovulatory and you put them on Clomid and you put the sperm closer with an IUI. So the combination treatment helps for unexplained infertility. For endometriosis, Clomid alone is not going to help you. Nothing about Clomid is going to improve the pathway of endo. Now, 
if you say, should I do Clomid and IUI? If everything else is normal and you're kind of unexplained with endometriosis, that could potentially be helpful. But in reality, the problem with endometriosis is an inflammatory environment. You've got this high inflammation from those implants of endometriosis, the same ones that are causing pain because your body is attacking them. It's a really hard, hard disease. And Clomid or Clomid IUI, they're not changing the environment at all. IVF is by far the most helpful thing, taking the eggs out of the body, fertilizing them with sperm in the lab that has no toxins and is the perfect pH, or undergoing surgery, depending on your situation, to take out the implants and then lower your inflammatory burden. Surgery helps temporarily, meaning it might help you improve your natural fertility for a short period of time. IVF is better suited if you have low ovarian reserve, if you're older, or if there's other fertility factors as well. Clomid, does it have risks? Well, maybe. Clomid can cause persistent ovarian cysts. It is one of the side effects. So the problem with that is like, what if you have this cyst that stays around and that could delay going on to IVF? So I don't love that option unless you also have an ovulatory issue that could be prohibiting you from conceive, of which case it would make a lot of sense to try an ovulation injection agent first. All right, friends, hope this was helpful. Again, for fertility Q&A, you can ask questions on the community tab or in the questions of this video, and we'll happily answer them. You can always follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, or check out the As a Woman podcast for more in-depth fertility-related information. Thank you.